So good morning, everybody, and uh, on behalf of everybody at uh, Forum Europe and of all of our partners for this event, a very warm welcome uh, to this morning's uh, webinar uh, that is going to be focusing on uh, releasing the potential of fixed wireless access in Europe. Um, we have a good couple of hours of, of discussions ahead of us, and we have uh, a great lineup of speakers um, with us. Um, so we're really looking forward to what I'm sure is going to be some really, really interesting discussion. Um, before we start, though, uh, just a couple of things I wanted to uh, to mention on uh, the logistical side. Um, first of all, uh, for the platform itself, uh, uh, hopefully, well, if, if you're watching me now, then you will have found the stage area of the platform where all of the sessions today are going to be taking place. So uh, all of the discussions will be taking place in this same area on the platform. Uh, if you go into the reception area, you can view the schedule uh, for today and uh, details of all the different sessions and the speakers and things like that. Um, on the right hand side of your screen, uh, you can see a chat bar and uh, we do um, please encourage you to, uh, to post as many messages as possible, questions for the speakers uh, and uh, any comments that you have in that chat bar. And we will be bringing those across uh, to, to speakers and putting those to our speakers and panelists during the discussion part of the session. So please do um, be as active as possible on there. We really do want to hear from you. We want to make sure that the, inter the discussions at this event are interactive and uh, you guys out there are a big, a big part of that. Um, I also wanted to say a very big thank you to our uh, supporting partners for the event. Uh, so that's to Arthur D. Little, uh, to Etno, to EDAT and to GSA. Uh, really do appreciate all of their support. And uh, yeah, without them, the event wouldn't be possible. So thank you very much uh, to all of them. Um, also, just going back to uh, some of the, the ways that you can get you can interact and things with the platform and also more broadly uh, during the, the event today, we do have a hashtag, uh, what we're using for the conference. The hashtag uh, you can see at the top of the screen, just above my head here, is hashtag FWA in Europe. If you're going to be tweeting about the event, if you're going to be uh, wanting to look at what other people are putting about the event on social media, please use that hashtag and, uh, and you'll be able to, uh, to join the discussion on social media as well. Um, finally, just wanted to mention that uh, the event that, we have, that, we're, that is taking place today, all of the sessions are being recorded. Uh, a recording of these sessions will be sent out to you uh, post-event. Uh, in addition, the slides that are being uh, used by our speakers today, again, those will be made available to you. You can find a link to those in the uh, reception area again on the platform. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to maybe uh, start with some of the, uh, the topics and start looking at kind of some of the key themes that we're going to be focusing on today. Um, so fixed wireless access, of course, is something that has been around for, for quite some time. Um, and it's maybe uh, not in the past uh, had um, you know the take up that possibly it was initially expected to do so. But now, as we enter the 5G era, uh, maybe some of the obstacles and some of the kind of the, the possible weaknesses in the past related to uh, speed or latency that can be offered by fixed wireless access and uh, and and uh, by by fixed line broadband connections. Um, with that, uh, possibly it's time for fixed wireless access to really maybe finally uh, release and, and to, to match or to meet some of its potential. So in the, uh, in the event today, we're going to be looking at that in a bit more detail. We're going to be focusing on the potential that fixed wireless access can play as part of national broadband plans uh, that are being developed across member states in Europe and the way in which it can help to contribute to EU connectivity targets, both in the short term and maybe looking forward to the longer term as well. And then finally, uh, with uh, a high number of uh, a, le a high level of public funding currently available uh, to boost connectivity through a number of funding programs, of course, the Recovery and Resil Resilience Facility and also other instruments, uh, we're going to be looking at how fixed wireless access fits within the context of this. 
So as I said, we've got a great lineup of the speakers to, uh, to look at these issues. We're going to be starting off very shortly with a keynote presentation, uh, and then we're going to be moving on to our first panel, which is going to be looking at the role of fixed wireless access in delivering the gigabit society in Europe. And then following a break, uh, we're going to be coming back with our second panel, which is going to be looking more at the funding side of things and looking at public funding initiatives to support fixed wireless access and wireless uh, infrastructure investments. So without further ado, uh, I would like to now uh, welcome to the stage our moderator, uh, both for the, uh, the keynote uh, presentation and also for the first session. Uh, and that's uh, Stephanie Cha from EDAT. So Stephanie, welcome. It's great to have you with us. As I said, really looking forward to what I'm sure is going to be some excellent discussion. So uh, without further ado, I will pass the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much. And uh, welcome, everyone, for this uh, first session and uh, for a very interesting uh, topic today. Um, before uh, stepping into the, the panel and discussing more the infrastructure side and uh, obviously the supply and demand for fixed wireless access, I would uh, really like to, uh, for you to welcome um, Franco Accordino, who is head of unit of uh, the investment in high capacity network at the European Commission for a keynote presentation. And then we will dive into why fix wireless access now, what's new, and how can it contribute to connecting Europe? Franco? Good morning, everyone. Thank you, really, uh, Stephanie, and thanks also to Dan uh, for inviting me to, to such an interesting event. Uh, I mean, I'm very glad to be here together with participants from industry, consultancy firms, and, and the public authorities at the same time. There would be another colleague from my, myself, Philippe, uh, later on, be involved in the same event and to discuss the opportunities uh, provided by FWA uh, technology and its uh, market prospects and how it can help uh, achieving the policy goals that we have set. Uh, so in the next 10, 15 minutes, I would, I would like really to recap what those policy goals are, because I think this would be, would be the main uh, targets we are working on all together for 2030. Um, uh, but also, uh, I'll also try to introduce a little bit the funding opportunities. Uh, Philippe then later on will elaborate a little bit more and also the latest developments in terms of regulatory measures to simplify, to facilitate access to investments, simplify deployment uh, and rollout of, of a gigabit capable infrastructures in Europe. So as an EU institution, our job is uh, really to create a fertile ground for, for the digital transition. Um, yeah, we want this digital transition. We are already in the middle of the transition, but we want to, it to accelerate and uh, um, deliver concrete advantages to the citizens, to the enterprises, to public administration and the economy and society at large. And this requires, this requires, it's an imperative, high quality connectivity. And allow me to say, from the very outset that the combination of 5G with the FWA technology has the potential to contribute to the achievement of the European connectivity targets set for the end of the decade. There are, of course, some important boundary conditions to be achieved. Uh, we need gigabit capable backhauling. Uh, an appropriate densification of 5G antennas in order for 5G FWA to deliver the appropriate uh, quality of service over the covered uh, areas. But I will expand a little bit more on that um, because it could be interesting for me to just make a few statements on question and then hear what would be also the output of the panel on that, how we can get there via including FWA technology. So, but before doing that, allow me really to recap what are the policy targets, as I said. So, you know, one year ago, I think it was really in June, May, May or June last year, we uh, made a proposal for the digital compass for, uh, for concrete targets by the end of the, the decade along four dimensions. So here I'm speaking about the four dimension. I could only focus on connectivity. I think it's very important to consider uh, the targets all to together in a holistic manner because connectivity is related, <laughs> is connected <laughs> to every other aspect of the digitalization. So the four dimensions are, where and are, again, still are, businesses, public services, skills and infrastructures. And when we speak about infrastructure, we speak about also different aspects of the infrastructure, connectivity, connectivity being 
one of them. So concerning connectivity specifically, we, the Compass sets out two targets for 2030. First, gigabit connectivity for all households. And secondly, gigabit, sorry, 5G coverage in all populated areas in Europe. So those two are intimately related because you know that uh, there is no much sense to have 5G with, uh, without uh, a gigabit capable uh, uh, um, backhauling. This is fundamental, of course. And the other way around, because you need to bring 5G, you need to bring also appropriate uh, fixed uh, connectivity to the base stations. So the two are intimately related and we see the two all together, though, of course, we measure the two separately. So the compass, as I said, sets also other type of uh, targets, uh, <clears throat> which just by, by setting them will trigger massive uh, deployment uh, and take up of connectivity. So, for instance, we set a target for businesses saying we want 75 75% uh, of the European companies to use a cloud the AI <coughs> uh, big data solutions and of course these will require proper connectivity then we want also public service to be 100% online these will also spur <coughs> policies and investments and reform to achieve uh, uh, to achieve to uh, and including on uh, on connectivity side to get to this target. And the same, we want at least 10,000 uh, uh, energy efficiency secure edge nodes in the EU. Also, these, these nodes will require connectivity at the appropriate level. So uh, just to again insist on the fact that when we set the policy target, we do it in a way that is uh, by definition interrelated and, and will definitely rely on the greatest possible quality of connectivity. So at the same time, I think it's important not to see connectivity uh, only to support directly the uh, uh, the other targets in the other in the other three fields, because obviously you know that between the connectivity and the use cases of the verticals, there is a lot in between. In particular, we know that there is the cloud to edge solutions um, uh, and uh, solutions for AI data harnessing the data, etc. And of course, in order to reach out the areas that are not necessarily easy for the market to reach, we need uh, uh, to consider all pro the, uh, the possible solutions. And FWA is one of them, cert certainly a very promising one. Um, of course, I mean, we, when, as I said, when we look at the quantity, we need to look also uh, at the um, in a very holistic manner, looking at the whole digital ecosystem, including the supply. You know that connectivity, <clears throat> the telecom sector is an important, let's say, consumer of, uh, of equipment and chips. So we have equipment manufacturers all around the world. We have the brilliant manufacturers in Europe as well, and they are made up of chips. So when we set a policy target for connectivity, the, uh, we trigger is a spillover effect, of course, along the whole value chain, in particular on chips. So all of this is totally uh, related. And you might say, Franco, you are speaking in a very, say, complex uh, manner. How are you going to ensure that we will like, achieve all these targets? Well, that is makes the difference because in September we made a, um, we made. A, um, um, we made a, a follow-up communication with the proposal for the digital decade policy program, where we said we, we reinforced again the targets, we, we, we reaffirmed the target that we have set in the digital compass, but also we proposed a way of working together between the Commission uh, and, and the, the Parliament, the Member States, and also, also all the, the, the stakeholders to make sure that we can uh, monitor, first of all, the targets every year, then uh, that would be via the, what you already know, the DESI in, the, the index, Digital Economy and Society Index. Um, uh, then we report regularly to the Parliament and the Council about the, the targets. And then we have a coordination mechanism put in place uh, with the Member States that every national policy legislation, uh, in a way that every legislation, any investment that uh, is made at the national or regional level we can assess whether or not this is in line with the contribution that these 
step, this action is making to the target that we have set. So of course, uh, we need to take into account the specificities, specificities of the individual member states, because especially when it comes to connectivity, uh, not, uh, you know, you know that the member states are characterized by different needs, by different geotypes, and therefore we need to consider the different, uh, the different approaches that the member states legitimately take together with, with, the, with the, their constituencies and their, commu their community of stakeholders. So this is basically, uh, in a nutshell, the policy context. Uh, of course, uh, um, uh, Philippe later on might elaborate on that, but allow me now to, to speak about the investment. So how concretely we support investment in gigabit connectivity. So, uh, you know, we have measured the so-called investment gap to achieve uh, the Gigabit Society 2025 targets uh, some uh, years ago with the help of the, the IB. And we estimated it to be in the order of 42 uh, billion year, uh, euro a year in order to fill in these connectivity uh, gaps. So what are the main funding opportunities to inject public uh, investment into the uh, into this uh, um, in, in, in the market in order to achieve these targets. So first of all, you have seen the RRF, Recovery Resilient Facility, where we have set 20% uh, minimum uh, uh, investment of the overall envelope given to the member states to be devoted to, to uh, digital. Well, the good surprise was that we have a 26% average of the member states invested in, investing in digital. And uh, when it comes to to, uh, to connectivity, we can count around the 13 billions uh, that member states have invested overall, huh? because there are member states that decide to use the RRF more to use for connectivity, for instance, Italy and Spain, for instance, others that legitimately decided to, to support the connectivity needs with the other for programs or their national funds. All of these is perfectly legitimate, but um, the main message here is that indeed uh, uh, this is this gives a lot of spin in certain member states um, and FWA was one of the technologies that was uh, chosen to support um, uh, their their RRF recovery resilience uh, goals um, so that for instance either uh, so this is absolutely an important signal for us because it goes, it resonates, I mean, it goes uh, hand in hand with uh, what we, we, we think about, indeed, FWA, if properly, you know, designed and deployed, can definitely support uh, the gigabit uh, objectives that we have set for the end of the decade. Then we have, in addition to the RRF, we have the RDF, the Regional Fund and the Agricultural Fund that are currently being uh, uh, the, the operational programs and the partnership agreements are currently being designed uh, by the member states and in cooperation with the Commission. Of course, though, uh, the good news is that digital is a priority in those programs and connectivity can be supported. So precisely if you look at the Agriculture Fund, you can imagine that they target also the rural areas where bringing fiber, bringing other type of fixed technology might not necessarily be straightforward. Therefore, the FWA solution could be a way forward. Then we have also InvestEU, which is our guarantee uh, fund uh, with the 26.2 billion, <clears throat> which aims at mobilizing more than uh, 370 billions in public and private investments. The good news is that at least 10% of this program will be will feed, we estimate will feed into digital goals. And of course, connectivity will be one of them. <clears throat> and then last but not least, we have the Connecting Euro Facility program, which we are more uh, managing directly. Actually, my unit is responsible for it, <clears throat> where we have uh, important investments related to 5G, including at the macro scale, the 5G corridors. Uh, um, um, then we have what is, what is called the 5G smart communities. Uh, we have also strategic deployment of strategic backbones uh, across member states. Um, so we have uh, issued the call uh, early in January early this year, and which closed is the first call on the 22nd of April. We are currently already analyzing the eligibility of proposals and. Uh, <clears throat> Um, and we expect to have a second call launch the, later <clears throat> this year in the autumn. <clears throat> Sorry. 
later later on uh, this year uh, and then uh, uh, and then another one in begin in in, uh, in 2023 20, and there will be other calls until 2027 the total envelope you, you might already know that is two billion more than two billion euro devoted as i said half of it to 5g and um um and uh, uh let's say uh, the important message i wanted to pass here is that we really want to use a cef because two billions you might look it's quite a lot of money yes but if we compare it to the annual gap that i just mentioned it's just uh too small huh? but the type of contribution that can give is uh, goes beyond the arithmetic or numerical aspect of the of the investment because we really want to to use uh, um, the CEF uh, along two axes. First, to complement what the member states typically do uh, with their national programs or with the, the, the shared management European programs like the regional funds or agriculture funds. So we want to complement because those funds will typically focus on the national needs, while the CEF, precisely with the 5G corridors along the major uh, transport <laughs> paths um, cross-border, this is, uh, uh, those are areas that typically are close to, I mean, market failure, or close to market failure, and therefore uh, where CEF can intervene, uh, CEF intervention makes sense, you know. So this is one element. So European level, we try to use the CEF budget. And then also we use the CEF to, uh, as a best practice mechanism. For instance, when deploying 5G in local communities, for instance, to support um uh use cases in the field of smart agriculture smart cities in general villages or transport or health uh, or, or education of course the knowledge needed the know-how for the local authorities to do these might not necessarily be there present at the, the, the fingertips so if you have uh, templates or blueprints that we can develop the european level and make them available to everyone that can facilitate the life of these small uh, communities uh, a lot huh? and so that is exactly what we do with our action under CEF so in a nutshell um, the CEF is a great opportunity because uh, 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 participating exceeding to the CEF calls huh, means also getting a flag of being uh, being uh, 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 you know an excellent project and uh, 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 can become a kind of uh, a template at the European level <clears throat> with, the, of course, a possible <clears throat> spillover effect uh, in terms of, uh, you know, generating more opportunities and accelerating the transition to 5G. And when we speak about 5G, we speak about, of course, uh, uh, both the mobile and the fixed side of it, because uh, um, uh, there are certain areas objectively that it's not uh, uh, cost effective, at least the first time being, to bring fiber from, from the very day one. Therefore, um, the FWA, again, represent a good, uh, a good alternative for, a certain, for certain cases, let's say. Of course, another point I wanted to say is that within the context of CEF, we promote a lot the use of financial instruments and blending operations and blending facilities. So. Uh, building on the success of the Connecting Europe Broadband Fund in terms of attracting uh, uh, private investors uh, into an equity fund. You, you, that we, this is a fund that we have uh, launched um, four or five years ago and little by little, year by year, uh, has uh, uh, gathered, you know, uh, um, attracted um, equity investments from, um, from the private sector. Uh, now there is a, a lively pipeline of projects that is... Uh, that is uh, um, uh, curated uh, um, and is uh, developing further. Uh, but of course, uh, on building on this experience um, um, uh, to to um, to attract. I will conclude a very. I need another two or three minutes, and then I'll conclude. Thank you. So uh, we we really need these uh, uh, these instruments because they facilitate a lot the the investments. Uh, for instance, by looking at the at the implication from the point of view of the state aid at market conformity, which is also quite important. So what do we do also at European level? We do also, we, we are working on important uh, uh, regulatory uh, um, measures. I mentioned only two, I will not elaborate on that. One is on the simplification and cost saving. We are working on the 
on the new on the revision of the broadband cost reduction directive based on the on the first version of this uh, directive which is uh, dated now 2014 and secondly we are working on the together with our colleagues in the G competition on the new uh, state aid broadband guidelines which bo in both cases we plan to release around summertime allow me to say a few more final words on FWA so of course as i already said this is a a, a quite uh, um, important technology for those areas that are uh, difficult to reach but also in certain sub-urban sub areas uh, which fail to attract large investments uh, due to certain socioeconomic conditions or because of, uh, of the topographic or graphic, uh, uh, let's say, situation of that areas. So sparsely populated areas, remote areas, that is absolutely a good uh, solution, of course. Um, it is important that FI FWA is... Uh, comes with the appropriate approach to fiberization of the base stations. This is very, and also with the proper densification approach, because from that point of view, we see FWA the quite, as a quite scalable technology. If you deploy the first version, you can later on intervene and scale it up uh, and improve, uh, let's say, um, uh, the performance. We know that about the performance, we should not limit ourselves by no means only to the uplink or downlink uh, uh, characteristics. There is the latency, low latency and uh, uh, error rate. They have also to fulfill certain quality standards for certain applications that we can envisage in the coming uh, uh, five to 10 years. In particular, we see in the coming five to 10 years an increasing convergence for certain type of categories between uplink and downlink. Take it for instance, cloud, the VPN, uh, they increasingly demand uh, symmetric, uh, let's say, uh, characteristics, even of, if not maybe 100% symmetric, but certainly uh, 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 narrowing the ratio between uplink and downlink. But especially there are applications at the horizon, uh, you know, the metaverse or uh, uh, augmented reality that needs, uh, uh, of course, low latency, other applications like e-health, re -tele telemedicine that require uh, zero uh, uh, error rate or, or close, uh, uh, close to zero error rate. Those things have to be considered. And I think as long as FWA can support this, that is welcome. We need to be technology neutral. And in this respect, if FWA is capable of supporting our gigabit target, this is uh, a very welcome uh, technology. Um, so I want really to conclude here. I could speak a bit more about about the more technical aspects about the FWA, but of course I prefer to to give the space to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Franco. Thank you very much for your uh, keynote. It was very um, interesting and exhaustive of all the the measures the Commission has uh, has put in place to to tackle uh, part of the digital divide and obviously your four digital. Um, uh, targets uh, and it's it's really good to to remind us that it's not only about connectivity and infrastructure it's also what you do about it and um, for, for the little story for those who um, who join us uh, we work with um, uh, with with Franco at uh, at IDAT with CBO consulting and vision visionary analytics um, on the private investment side of how to deploy the network and obviously, uh, fixed wireless access was one of the technology satellite also um, in this group of technology neutral uh, elements to provide uh, gigabit speeds to, to all, um, according to the targets. Um, we might have time for one question before uh, moving to the panel. So um, I, there was one question uh, from a journalist about um, uh, the, the funding, I'm not sure if it's going to be um, uh, answered in the next session, but um, one of the questions was like, how, how can money be directed to location that would not otherwise be served? Uh, you were um, talking about uh, market failures in some instances in terms of connectivity. How do you target those in particular? Well, I just mentioned, basically, we, we act at two levels. First, investments. There are investments particularly dedicated to the rural areas. Uh, 
there is a rural action plan that we develop also together with uh, with the colleagues in the DG agriculture. So of course, uh, the investment is only one side. Uh, secondly, so in, 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 in most of the cases, these investments are made by the member states and therefore they can be qualified as state aid in, um, uh, because uh, it, the decision is, is uh, for the member states. Uh, um, so to facilitate, let's say, uh, the investments, we are working also on the new broadband guidelines for state aid, which uh, uh, we, uh, um, where we try to broaden as much as possible uh, the scope of market failure by raising the thresholds and uh, allowing for uh, the intervention to take place in the market failure areas more easily than uh, it would be with the current guidelines, which date 2013. So this update you will see, hopefully soon, will provide, a, will, will unleash plenty of more possibilities for the rural areas and for the market failure areas in general. And in defining these uh, market failure thresholds, uh, uh, we try to be as much as possible tech neutral, as, uh, as, as you already know, by using uh, definitions like VHCN. In VHCN, you know that we have to have at, uh, either fiber to the household or the base station, or we have to have the equivalent of uh, one gigabit download and 200 megabit uplink performance. So uh, with, this, with this neutral definition, we ensure that, for instance, fiber uh, infrastructures are not overbuilt um, uh, because this is part of the definition of VHCN, and that other technologies that can provide equivalent performance are also not over, are protected. You know, so this guarantees a technology, being it FWA or maybe the future of the DOCSIS, uh, that IDAT has also studied quite uh, quite a lot will uh, can continue if they are capable of updating and uh, delivering increasing performances along the, the lines that we have indicated in our policy policy targets i hope i i reply to dave yes, yes. um maybe a very short if if you can keep it short um overview of fixed wireless access in the new uh, broadband cost reduction directive What's the well, place of I, it, I, and if, is it say, targeted? Of course, I have to say that I've, I've, <laughs> I'm not in the position to, to share at this stage the insight of what will come in the, the TRD, but certainly you can imagine, I mean, it's not science fiction, uh, there is a, a, a benefit. So FWA will benefit from the new, the new uh, BCRD because for what I said, with the 5G FWA, you need to have by the, you need to have fiber to the base stations, and fiber base station means that you you again you face the same problems that you have uh, that you have when you have uh, to 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 lay down uh, buried infrastructures, so permits, uh, access to information, access to civil engineering works, uh, sharing this information. So we we aim to really dramatically simplify these things. So if you want to build an FWA solution and you need to, to back all your base stations with fiber, of course, you can be guaranteed, you can be assured that you will be, you know, facilitated by the new BCRD um, in laying down the proper backhauling. Then of course, from the point of view of, uh, yeah, of the, the more wireless uh, side of it, of course, on that, of course, the, the impact will be slightly less, but, uh, that is, uh, I mean, the fact that uh, that FWA is uh, dramatically simpler than uh, uh, fixed uh, solutions, well, that is not a mystery, of course, you, because you don't have to do major works for that. That's the reason why you use it. So, but the fixed components or the fixed component of it, of course, this will benefit like uh, any other infrastructure, I would expect. Thank you very much, Franco. Thank you very much for, for being with us and for, the, for this keynote. Um, we're ready to move on to, to the panel uh, right now. Um, so let me introduce uh, everybody before introducing a little bit the topic. Uh, so uh, with us today, we will have uh, Konstantinos Macedos, who's president of the Greek regulator EETT 
and incoming chair uh, for 2023 of uh, BEREC. Then we'll have uh, Bent Andres Turva, head of section for spectrum planning at uh, the Norwegian regulator ENCOM. Katri Perala, who's a director of home broad broadband business at uh, DNA Finland. Uh, Julien Grivola, chair of GSA 4G and 5G uh, fixed wireless access forum. And uh, Patrick Robinson, who's vice president Europe of ATEL. So a quick few notes before I open um, uh, the, the panel and, and let everybody uh, present what they're doing in, in the fixed wireless access um, uh, scene. As we saw with, with Franco, and I want to take you back to a very traumatic event we all, uh, we all lived uh, back in March 2020, where every country closed one after the other because of the COVID uh, pandemic. That's a time where more than before, we, we say that COVID accelerated uh, things. And yes, um, uh, the, the transition to higher capacity networks was um, taking place before. But truly what we understood is if we want to continue living, this life will have to be partially online, if not all online for those working, for example, in the metaverse in AI. So you need to be connected and you need to have access to uh, a good connection. So be it for work, uh, teleworking, like we're all online today, for learning, uh, schools, universities, um, uh, executive education, um, and, and all those elements, uh, entertainment, obviously, have, have, have taken a very important place online. So more than just infrastructure, it's also the demand side and what people need to do with them from a business or personal uh, perspective that's important. And my first encounter with fixed wireless access for, for a little background story, um, the first lockdown I was, um, I needed to, to go to an Airbnb because of, uh, of a sick person in my, in my household and uh, the fiber there uh, didn't work. So they had a backup a fixed wireless access uh, router that enabled me to continue working and continue uh, being in touch with others. And I think it was LTE based. So we talked a lot of um, 5G. Um, fixed wireless already exists as uh, an LTE technology, obviously 5G and we will see will bring uh, more um, features uh, into that. So that's a backup plan that is coming, becoming a central um, solution for some household also depending on uh, cost of deployment uh, versus other technology and going into the gigabit speeds thanks to uh, 5G, 6G and all the other Gs that will follow up. Uh, we saw with Franco that the commission has done a lot of work uh, to, to fund, to help, to support the deployment of um, neutral uh, gigabit uh, infrastructure so again, in, in, in different uh, technologies. So far, uh, we know that broadband coverage and, and ultra fast broadband has reached um, a significant uh, portion of the, the population, mostly in rural uh, um, uh, urban area versus a rural that are still gray to white zones. And um, we have to, to acknowledge that with all the different targets in, in the Commission's agenda, the, the digital 2020 uh, targets have not been fully met. And now we're faced with even more uh, speeds and infrastructure targets in the 2025 uh, gigabit communication agenda and the digital decade goals. So we have a real um, uh, momentum to deploy um, a faster network uh, for all. We know now that ultra-fast broadband is essential. Some say it's becoming a commodity like electricity and gas. And fixed wireless access is a big part of it uh, right now. As I said, either as a backup solution or a full solution, sometimes in the, the white areas where the cost of deploying the last mile is 
uh, very high. So there are questions about finance, uh, financing and regulating uh, the um, uh, fixed wireless access. And we'll touch a bit uh, about that um, in, in the panel. And a strong link today with the green agenda, because as you all know, connectivity and green are the, the two um, power ball of, of the, the commission and focus of, of the commission. So uh, without further ado, um, let me uh, start this panel. So this panel will draw um, an outlook of where we stand in terms of fixed wireless access uh, deployments, uh, the different strategies uh, in different member states to, to deploy and um, we have uh, we have Katri from DNA. How do you sell it as well uh, to the um, uh, to the uh, customers? And obviously uh, the ecosystem who is involved in the fixed wireless access ecosystem right now, which devices are, are needed to make it happen. So a very um, broad, large, and um, interesting discussion ahead. Um, so please uh, let me welcome um, Konstantinos uh, for his. Uh, uh, opening uh, remarks, and uh, then we'll take all the questions at the end of, of the panel, and you can uh, put them in, in the chat. Thank you. Kostas? Thank you, Stephanie, thank you. and um, thank you for having me here today in this very interesting uh, panel discussion. Well, global demand for broadband connectivity from both households and, and enterprises has been strong for several years now. Um, Globally, the fixed broadband market is growing, and according to the ITU, fixed broadband subscriptions have increased by 5% annually over the, the past five years. The European strategy for the digital decade, outlined in the 2030 Digital Compass, sets very ambitious objective with regards to fixed connectivity. All European households should be offered one gigabit per second access by 2030 in a technology-neutral way. That's a clear call for fiber FTTX deployment acceleration, but also a call for extending and widening fixed wireless access reach to subscribers across Europe if we want this gigabit for all vision to have its fair share of chances for, for success. Over the last couple of years, I think the public speaking sphere overwhelmingly discuss the pros and cons of wired versus wireless deployments for next generation networks. The fact that there is a certain threshold that allows or prohibits FTTX deployment is well communicated and understood. That is a subscriber density related threshold and it does change from country to country, but not in a way that would drastically change the norm. Densely populated areas go to fiber. Fixed wireless access can pick up where FTTX is prohibit prohibitively expensive, either via 4G or 5G modems going stationary or via millimeter wave radio, unlicensed band using hardware. These two sentences, I'm afraid, distill all that's, all that's been discussed up until today and that's not good enough for servicing our gigabit society's vision. So what's next? I believe what's next is the complex discussion of first, hybrid fixed wireless access networks, and second, smart cities fixed wireless access integration. From the technical perspective, most, if not all, fixed wireless access challenges narrow down to one problem, line of sight, versus non-line of sight, a problem also known as spectrum cost. Radio links having visual line of sight between the transmitter and the receiver typically provide high speeds and low costs. Low costs come with an asterisk and practically means capability to operate first, capability to operate in unlicensed wave bands like the 60 gigahertz typically. Second, capability to shift costs because costs never magically disappear from the core radio network deployment phase towards the subscriber activation phase. This latter characteristic replaces the impossible FTTX in sparse populated areas business plan with a very convenient and realistic pay-as-you-grow business plan since adding cost at customer activation phase means that the investor secures a revenue stream first 
the customer to be activated before investing further. Investing further in this case relates to subsidizing the new subscriber's CPE cost, which is typically expensive, as well as dealing with installation and installation adaptation complexities, like trees growing, buildings rising, heavy wind, weather overall, uh, and similar challenges. On the other hand, non-line of sight bands, typically licensed 4G and 5G bands, offer low overall cost on hardware through benefiting from mobile world economies of scale, which allows silicon and other critical component costs to be in the few dollars uh, range while integrated incredible technologies. The non-line of sight world is dominated by mobile operators for profound reasons. They already have license spectrum, while the line of sight world is dominated by challengers. Unless we start evaluating hybrid networks, our quest to the fixed wireless access world would already have end by what we have already mentioned. By hybrid fixed wireless access networks, I mean deployment scenarios using line of sight technologies to interconnect base stations while relying on 4G and 5G for connecting subscribers to the network, the mobile operator's case, or Wi-Fi, the challenger's case, to do so. Such scenarios will help operators to cut costs in the backhaul and challengers in the access. Both are wins for speeding up deployment and lowering costs for end users, so a primary concern for me and every NRA. What's more to do in this area is to, use, uh, is to check spectrum auction opportunities in frequency bands sitting in the line of sight, non-line of sight limit, where minor obstacles sitting between the receiver and the transmitter can be forgiven and not causing a link to fail even temporarily. That's on top of my study to do list for fixed wireless access. Also, as mentioned earlier, smart cities fixed wireless access integration is also a personal interest and concern. Through a very simple, low-tech, but very practical example, smart cities fixed wireless access integration is about addressing problems as the following one. Fixed wireless access can do most of the things a fixed wireless access network needs wirelessly, but not all. Powering fixed wireless access base stations and in general radio network side equipment cannot be done wirelessly. Simplifying the regulatory access framework around street lighting poles and allowing access to this humble but critical infrastructure can deliver a decisive win in promoting fixed wireless access deployments, both for mobile operators and millimeter wave challengers in equal parts. To conclude, getting one gigabit per second to everyone across Europe within the next seven years is a hard goal to go after, but a very inspiring one, definitely a goal worth fighting for, and if we want to give this goal a fair chance of success, fixed wireless access absolutely has to be part of the solution. The event today is a great opportunity to share views and communicate the importance of adding fixed wireless access to the Digital Compass 2030 mix of tools. So thank you very much for the opportunity to share my views on the matter. And I'm really looking forward for the discussion later. Thank you very much, Kostas. Um, I know as a head of, uh, of, of BEREC, in a bit you'll have a, a lot of, uh, of work to do on, on, on this topic. And as the Greek regulator with all the geographical specificities of the country, islands are, are really looking into that technology to, to get connected. Um, I would like uh, now to invite um, uh, Ben uh, to discuss, his, he's also uh, on the regulatory side, uh, with more advanced work on fixed wireless access and share your views and, and what you've been implementing um, on your site. Yes, uh, thank you, Stephanie, and good morning, everyone. Um, <clears throat> I'll just give you a short introduction to, uh, to the, the regulatory situation in, in Norway and, and how we uh, see fixed wireless access as a, as a tool to... Uh, to reach out to, um, to the whole population of Norway and provide the uh, high-speed internet. And next slide, please. Uh, first up, uh, two important principles uh, in the Norwegian broadband market. Um, first up, uh, uh, minimum regulation. 
an investment friendly regulation to to harvest broadband build out and second uh, cooperation where uh, market driven investments are the main rule and uh, and, and also the, the last uh, parts of norway where it's not uh, financially um, um, so there is uh, there is no money for the the, the providers. Um, you can also use state and, and local public money. Next slide, please. Um, there is a political ambition in Norway to provide broadband uh, to 100% of the the population by the end of 2025. Uh, the current coverage. Uh, uh, for 100 uh, megabits down uh, download and, and 10 megabits upload is 90 percent for one gigabit it's 87 uh, percent um for the for the fixed broadband uh, so fiber investments uh, they are typically driven by by local uh, and a few national uh, utility providers <clears throat> and uh their business cases are uh, most often based on internet and t TV office. Um, recently, there was uh, uh, released a report in Norway uh, said that uh, an accelerated deployment of gigabit infrastructure uh, until 2025 could, could result in a gain of uh, 25 billion Norwegian kroners. Um, and the cost estimation for uh, for this 100% build-up with uh, fiber is 16.6 billion Norwegian kroners. Um, and if we can use uh, uh, fixed wireless access or 4G or 5G, um, the cost estimate is uh, 3 billion Norwegian kroners. Um, there is a different in difference in in the, in the download and upload uh, speed there, but uh, but still. Uh, next slide, please. Five um, <clears throat> G is uh, we see that is very important for mobile and as a, a complement to fixed broadband rollout. Uh, uh, because of that, uh, up to 560 million Norwegian kroners, or approximately 56 million euros, uh, of the 5G auction revenue um, in 2021, um, can be used in order to roll out high-speed internet uh, to underserved served households, or the, the last two or three percent of the population. Um, NCOM provides a list of, uh, of predetermined households uh, for for the M M nodes to, uh, to 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 have a list uh, so they can choose the areas they want to to roll out their uh, high speed internet or broadband. Um, this is uh, was in addition to other. Uh, state aided broadband deployments. Uh, next slide, please. Um, for some verticals, uh, uh, they may have other needs than uh, than the uh, MNOs uh, can provide, um, and because of that, uh, we have uh, uh, started to develop uh, a regulation for 3.8 to 4.2 gigahertz band for private and non-public networks. Um, it's uh, based on the UK regulation, <clears throat> but we have uh, also started some pilot uh, project with some um, actors uh, that wants to build out these networks and and we are working to, to establish the final regulation together with these uh, uh, 
these uh, actors. Um, yes, uh, I think that uh, concludes my presentations for now. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you very much for this presentation. I um, I noted several interesting points. I was actually talking about the geographical um, uh, typology in Greece, but you also face challenges in deploying high capacity network uh, in Norway. And I wrote that um, you, you find at least um, uh, for now fixed wireless access as a good way to, to connect the underserved population in a faster and, and more efficient way than uh, and cost effective way uh, than, than other uh, technology. And that's that's why you are also focusing on that. Um, and, and 5G uh, as um, uh, helping you in the de de delivering, sorry, the speeds and the, and the giga gigabit uh, targets. Um, thank you for that. To, to move now to, to CATD, I want to know, because you face also the similar um, uh, problem in Finland as in Norway, from a, uh, an operator point of view, how is fixed wireless access part of your home broadband um, uh, solution and, and how is it deployed, how is it priced, how do you engage with clients on, on fixed wireless access? Hello, everybody, and greetings from Finland. Finland, as some of you may know, is a relatively big country with a relatively little amount of people living in it. The Finnish broadband market can be divided into two segments, and it is actually a 50-50 split between the multi-dwelling units in the cities and then the single dwelling units in the suburbs and in the countryside. The MDUs are very much catered with fiber and coax connections, but fixed wireless access has opened us new opportunities to offer high quality, high speed broadband services to the SDUEs. And from telco perspective, fixed wireless access allows us to offer fixed connections to new areas where we haven't had fixed connections available before. And like Costas also mentioned, it, it offers a cost efficient way to cater areas where housing density might not be adequate to make the fiber investments worthwhile. And I know this is not a shared challenge across Europe, but uh, building fiber is tricky in a country where half the year the land is frozen, uh, whereas fixed wireless access can be delivered when, whenever. The definition of fixed wireless access varies in different countries and in many cases it can mean an outdoor unit or even in some cases indoor unit with 4G or 5G best effort subscriptions. At DNA we also have that type of offering available for our customers but with fixed wireless access proposition uh, we offer even more. It is a professionally installed high quality 5G connection that comes with a speed guarantee. Next slide, please. With the DNA Home 5G, we wanted to build a proposition for the S2Es that would fix the pain points of current 4G and VDSL users are having but also uh, we wanted to create a solution that could realistically compete as an alternative for the fiber. As you know, 4G networks can occasionally get too much traffic, so the speed is not adequate at all the time, whereas VDSL technology is not capable of catering the needs of today's broadband customers, at least not in the Finnish customers with heavy data usage. In the core of DNA's fixed wireless access proposition is a 100 uh, meg speed guarantee. Yeah, you normally get to enjoy the 400 or 1 gig speed you have subscribed. But even in the kind of special rush hour occasions, uh, we will always ensure that there's enough space to enjoy your favorite Netflix series or high quality video conferencing calls. 
So from customer point of view, fixed wireless access offers fast fiber-like connectivity with easy installation that can be del delivered in, in just a few weeks all year long. And compared to fiber, it's, it's cheaper to get. The delivery time is few weeks compared to worst case, a uh, few years. And there's, of course, no need to dig your gardens or yards to get the connection to your home. The installation fee of fixed wireless access, this 5G we are offering, is half or one quarter of the price of a fiber. The monthly subscription fees, on the other hand, start at a very similar price level. Uh, what we know is that the customers who have ordered DNA's fixed wireless access solution have been extremely satisfied and the NPS is actually much higher than in any other broadband product we have. Next, please. Um, DNA's customers have been one of the world's most avid mobile data users already for several years now. And the data usage of fixed wireless access customers grew by 12% from 2020 to 2021. And the daily usage is 16 gigs, which is over twice more than 5G routers having a 5G best effort subscription and over four times more than a basic 4G home broad, uh, broadband users are, are using. So basically the data usage doubles when moving to a better technology, indicating that uh, people who use a lot of data are also willing to invest on a better solution, um, uh, kind of offering a better customer experience. And actually fixed wireless access can cater this need extremely well. Uh, in Finland, the mobile network quality and coverage are extremely good. Uh, the DNA's 5G network already covers almost two thirds of the Finns. Uh, so based on, on kind of the place of uh, residence, um, which means that more than 3.6 million people are getting to enjoy 5G at their homes. Now, uh, the expansion of the 5G network continues and it is to cover 99.9% .9 of the Finns in the coming years to meet up the 4G LTE coverage we already have in place today. Thank you. That was my intro for the panel. Thank you very much, uh, Katri. Um, it, it's actually very good to also have numbers of how uh, fast you can deploy fixed wireless access compared to, to fiber or other technology and be confident that the roses in the garden won't be trenched out to, to deploy fiber um, and, and really uh, grasp the full capacity of uh, 5G fixed wireless uh, access. Um, to, to know more about where we stand right now, um, uh, let's get some, some statistics and, and know more about um, uh, the technology. Uh, Julien, if you, you want to, to come up and, and enlighten us a little bit, uh, what are we talking about? How much are we talking about? And where are we headed? Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, I would like to thank also the Forum Europe for the invitation to invite the GSA for the 5G Fixed Wireless Access Forum to attend and present. I mean, it has been said already a couple of times. Um, to us, 4G, 5G Fixed Wireless Access is just is simply needed to close the digital divide in Europe or globally. And uh, especially having in mind the 2025 uh, you know, targets in, in, in Europe. We should not forget these ones as well. They are very important as it has been mentioned by um, Bent just before uh, in Norway. Um, can we move to the next slide, please? So here clearly, um, as we have um, seen, COVID-19 has uh, contributed to put and emphasize even more than before the need for reliable uh, broadband connectivity for home working, for personal life, everything. But nevertheless, uh, globally, we all know that there are still 3.7 billion people who are not yet connected. So at the forum, as we have explained so many times, uh, we really 
think that fixed wireless access is a life changer because you are you have to have be, you have to have to be connected with a, a reliable uh, solution and um, so fixed wireless access in that sense is really critical um, and this is true for developing countries developed countries uh, i think stephanie just mentioned before that some uh, countries are now considering uh, broadband connectivity as a commodity and I would like maybe just to, to give and emphasize the European side of things. Um, a couple of weeks ago, there was this uh, conference on the future of Europe. Uh, they, there was a communique about it, uh, and they agreed like 49 uh, detailed proposals at the end of April. And one of them, so to be um, uh, perfectly correct, the proposal 31 uh, is called access to digital infrastructure. And the objective is, Equal access to the internet is a fundamental right of every European citizen. And honestly, to, to be able to do so in the time frame we have, uh, fixed wireless access is just uh, indispensable. We have to have it. Can we move to the next slide, please? So why is it in, uh, so much needed? Uh, we have discussed briefly all the benefits both by uh, 5G and 4G fixed wireless access. Uh, we have just heard from uh, Katri that uh, the time to market is uh, very important. Fixed wireless access, you can get the connectivity uh, installed very quickly. You can scale, as it has been mentioned earlier as well, so you can bring more capacity, you can improve the speeds, the, the features, and so on, almost on an on-demand basis. So you follow uh, what is happening in your network, and then you improve and you expand. It's very easy to do. and. As I think it has been recognized also by Franco uh, in his introduction, uh, we need to have a, a, a series of technologies. Fiber is very great technology, it's a very good technology, but it cannot address all uh, situations efficiently. And uh, maybe Stephanie shared a personal uh, experience before, I can also men mention mine. Uh, I have been living for five years on the wrong side of the road. So fiber was available on the other side of the street, and I have two megabit per second connectivity on my side of the street. And there was nothing else to do than waiting for uh, a new set of uh, public funding investment, which was supposed to happen five years later. And finally, it has been postponed. So what I was doing when I had uh, critical meetings like the one today, I had to use my mobile phone and rely on the 4G connectivity. Uh, so I think uh, this is demonstrating the, the, the strengths of the mobile connectivity, mobile technologies. So having all those things in mind, uh, at the end of um, 2020, several companies put their hands together and agree some objectives, because as we are seeing today, there is still much to be done about um, educating the industry, educating the market about 4G, 5G, fixed wireless access capabilities, about the ecosystem behind, how quickly this is deployed, what kind of benefit the end users are getting. And this is why we have uh, created this organization. Uh, Dan, please, can we move to the next slide? So you can see on the left uh, part of the screen, all our members. So when we started, we were, I think, 15, 16 companies at the end of um, 2020. We are today 47 members. And as you can see, all dimensions of the fixed wireless access ecosystem, the 4G, 5G fixed wireless access ecosystems, are represented. So we have infrastructure, all the leading infrastructure vendors, CPE vendors, um, uh, chipset vendors, module vendors. We are all contributing into this effort to educate the market about uh, these technology uh, benefits. We are publishing different um, reports. One of them is uh, the uh, what we call the catalog, which is uh, the device ecosystem company directory, where all our members have one page to introduce the products they are uh, <clears throat> offering to the market. We have uh, information about CPEs, modules, and chipset there. We also conducted what is, I think, very, very important, which is uh, on the right part of the slide here, this uh, device market survey study, uh, where we, in fact, uh, shared some uh, information about shipments to really try to give a sense of what is the uh, average uh, number of shipments on an annual basis for fixed wireless access. And try to also help the uh, analysts in the industry or operators to get a sense of the size, the real size of the market, because there are so many definitions of fixed wireless access. There is confusion and we have um, 
we, we really wanted to bring a little bit more clarity on uh, these aspects. So basically, we have shared our, uh, under confid respecting confidentiality rules, obviously, we have uh, shared information about the shipments and we have uh, a huge volume of 75 million units, for example. And we are organizing regularly uh, webinars. The last one was last week, allowing uh, people to share best practices about fixed wireless access. Can we move to the next and final slide, please? And not... Um, not only we are doing this, we are also uh, representing the fixed wireless access industry uh, voice in different occasions. Uh, so we have obviously contributed to the public consultation uh, on, that was ongoing in Europe about the public state aid for broadband guidelines. And we have uh, really uh, pushed some recommendations to the authorities. So obviously um, the um, draft proposal is going in the right direction. This is technology agnosity is uh, promoted, uh, but fixed wireless access, we think should be uh, emphasized maybe a little bit more. Uh, we should make um, funding eligible, not only to passive, but also active uh, components. I think uh, one thing that has already been mentioned, vouchers uh, on the CPE side to cover the high price 5G CPEs at this point in time to help this um, cost to be lower for end users would be uh, something very interesting. And as it has been mentioned as well, fixed wireless access is not just about, um, you know, fixed wireless access in the sense of broadband connectivity. 4G, 5G fixed wireless access also, uh, also have lots of synergies with the 5G uh, agenda that all countries have. Many countries have a 5G action plan. So investing in this kind of solution, it's, uh, you know, investing uh, one cent to achieve two objectives. So it's one stone killing two birds, if you wish. So we really want to, to promote uh, this uh, kind of technologies. And also we need to keep realistic uh, uh, ambitions in terms of what kind of connectivity is really needed by end users. And so I, I will stop here. I hope I was not too long. And um, yeah, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Julien. Um, it's really interesting that um, digital infrastructure is finally uh, recognized as essential. Uh, and I think you said fundamental rights. Yeah. I, I really like how you, you, you also touch on how national broadband plans have to include uh, fixed wireless access and or be technologically neutral. And also, um, it, it's a discussion we will have later because I'm really interested, um, uh, as you know, about the ecosystem and the, the devices uh, world around uh, fixed wireless access. But just before um, before that, let us uh, welcome Patrick, um, who will uh, tell us a, a little bit more, also touching on this uh, aspect and, and mostly the road with uh, 5G fixed wireless access, maybe six, maybe more. Patrick, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stephanie, and good morning, everybody from Ireland. Um, <clears throat> when I was asked to speak um, for this webinar and I was asked to give a, a short five minute introduction, I, I had to have a bit of a think, you know, what can a hardware manufacturer do to make something interesting? And I was either going to go down the, the, the roadmap route and show you what's coming in, or I'd rather tell you the story of, of fixed wireless access right from the very beginning. So if we can go to the first slide, please. This whole journey started approximately 19 years ago in 2003 with the launch of 3G wideband CDMA. Back then we had the dizzy broadband speeds of two megabits per second at launch. And we typically had two um, early products launch. One was from Novotel Wireless, which is where I worked at the time. And the other was from Option in Belgium. And between the two companies, we pretty much captured um, about 50% each of the, 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 the market in Europe, um, approximately about uh, 25, 30 million um, devices in, in two years. Um, what we then started to see was a bit of an evolution because there was no real ecosystem uh, within the, the, the 3G space. And one thing that we saw very early on is we started to see a lot of PCM CIA data cards coming back um, completely fried out, and we couldn't figure out why. And um, in all the test conditions, again, we couldn't figure out why. And then we noticed a lot of uh, Wi-Fi access points were appearing on the market 
with PCMCIA slots. Now, these things weren't designed, the, the PCMCIA cards were never designed to, to go into um, a route of the shielding wasn't on them. So we, we kind of made the, the light bulb moment that this is why we're seeing these cards coming back. So we, we, <coughs> we in Europe spoke to our CTO at the time and we said, look, there's a market for this. Um, why don't we do an embedded um, piece of CPE and, and see where it takes us? I was told to go off and find a customer and that first customer was O2 Germany. So the, the desire to have fixed wireless access is actually about 18 years now. Um, so O2 launched their O2 home package and very rapidly o, Vodafone approached us. They wanted their version. They also wanted it to support fax and voice. They wanted to have a, um, a wireless fixed line replacement device. Um, the challenge that that threw up was that none of the 3G modules at the time supported fax. So we had to use an old GSM module as well, which gave us a, a rather bulky uh, product, which you can see um, underneath there, which was called Vodafone Zoo Hauser. Um, they were both purchased in volume. So the demand was there and O2 sold through 20,000 pieces in the first month. Um, and it became pretty much established that, you know, Wireless, fixed wireless access or mobile broadband, as we called it back then, um, was becoming um, more and more. Um, we then saw different form factors coming into play. Um, HSDPA was coming down the road. Chipsets were getting smaller and cheaper. And we saw the advent of the USB dongle. So the USB dongle was uh, able to be used on laptops that didn't have PCMCIA slots, i.e. cheaper laptops. We then started seeing uh, the advent of uh, mini PCI Express modules uh, that were able to be dispatched to as, as an OEM uh, product into router manufacturers and so on. Uh, we also saw the PCMCIA get smaller and faster. Um, we saw other products coming in from other manufacturers. We started seeing the MoFi for the first time. And all, all, the way, all the way along speeds were getting faster. So the two megabits per second jumped to about six megabits per second. And then it jumped all the way through to 21 megabits per second. And then we started seeing industrial products coming out. Um, industrial products, uh, industrial routers with Sarin were typically used um, CCTV, um, EPOS and, and ATM connectivity became a big thing. Um, and they, they started, they started selling in, in good numbers. Um, and then what we then saw throughout the rest of, of that decade was the ecosystem gradually touching base with everything. We saw adapters coming out for USB modems. Um, again, it was like a cheap alternative to getting an embedded router. Um, and, and what we saw over that time period, um, that was that six year time period, was an entire ecosystem evolve all around the use of broadband on the move. It could have been for people in apartment blocks that couldn't get broadband um, up to their apartment or people in rural areas that had 3G, but they, they, there was no chance of them getting DSL. It, we started the same product and we started the same product selling well. So we go to the next slide, please, Stephanie. So the, the ecosystem had evolved. Um, what typically happened over the next 10 years was speeds started to evolve and we started to see new technology. So beamforming was one of the big ones and MIMO uh, was another um, area that, that started to come into its own. So MIMO is not, not new, it's been around since about 1996, but there was never really a mass market requirement for it. But when we got to the end of HSDPA plus and 3G, suddenly we realized using MIMO, we could actually double that data speeds up to 42 megabits per second. And that was a good interim measure. But um, in December 2009, <coughs> we had the very first uh, 4G network rolled out in Sweden uh, with Tilly. And now all of a sudden the, the technology was evolving. So all the CPE manufacturers were starting to race ahead now. Um, 
we started lots of seeing, seeing lots of other players coming in. We started seeing Huawei, ZTE, we started seeing ATEL. Um, at the time, I was working for Option. Um, and beam forming was another area that started coming into its own as well. It was relatively new. And, and to explain beam forming for the non technical, um, if you were to throw a, the floodlights on in a stadium, you're pretty much going to illuminate everything. But beam forming was the ability to direct that energy at an individual device. Hence, it'd be like putting on a very large LED um, flashlight to zoom in on one person. So beamforming and MIMO started taking off. We then also started seeing the LTE speed start to increase. Um, they came in pretty much 100 kilobits per second, jumping almost rapidly to 150 megabits per second. Uh, apologies, I just said kilobits on the, on the last one. So Cat1 never really deployed as a product. Uh, everything kind of jumped to Cat4. So Cat4 was something all of a sudden people had that could even improve on DSL speeds. Um, the ecosystem carried on maturing and speed started increasing. When we got up to CAT6, uh, which doubled um, CAT4, um, then we started having serious speeds. We started seeing in many countries um, the, the ability for uh, fixed wireless access um, in, in, in its true flavors. Within ATEL, a bit before my time, we then started seeing the requirement for outdoor units. So in hot countries, there would be a lot of problems with the materials within buildings or, or it could be the lead in the thermal reflective glass, but the, the signal indoors would be pretty poor compared to the signal outdoors. So the answer to that, stick a modem and an advanced antenna array in, a, in an outdoor unit, make it weatherproof, pipe the cable in through, um, well, through coax, get a nice, uh, nice chunky access point on the inside. Hey, presto, you've got broadband in rural areas. There's particularly large uptake of this type of fixed wireless access throughout Africa. Um, even today, they're continuing all the way through to, to CAT 12, which is 600 megabits per second. Um, now, that took us over a period of 10 years to get all the way through the LTE um, and categories and the LTE evolution. Patrick, I'm, I'm I'm sorry to interrupt. I think your your time is unfortunately up. If I could ask you to make your your conclusions, we do need to to move on to the the, the questions, if so, if, if possible. So okay, uh, jump jump to the last slide, please. I'll I'll wrap this up quickly. Thank you. So now we have an entire ecosystem of uh, 5G product. We went to the second um, um, evolution, and um, so the speeds have already uh, doubled um, in speed. The things to look out for, which are coming down the line, um, you've got reconfigurable intelligent services. These will make a big difference to the deployment of millimeter wave. Uh, it's, it's the ability to put, put tiny little nodes on street furniture to, to boost non-direct line of sight uh, reflections. Uh, millimeter wave will make its, its, its debut properly uh, within the next 12 months. Um, this is largely down to free or, or cheap spectrum. And, and 5G advanced, you will see in the next 12 months. Sorry for, for going over time there, Dan. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick. I, it's, uh, it's actually very interesting. Uh, I did not know that fixed wireless access has been in the in the pipes for the last 18 years. Uh, that That's a long time. And um, I, I really appreciate how, how you uh, walked us through the, the products and life cycle and how they are becoming more uh, performant and efficient to be able to carry the promises of fixed wireless um, access. Um, let, let's open the, the discussion uh, now. Um, we've had a lot of uh, questions uh, in, in the chat, so please feel free to, uh, to, send, uh, to continue sending uh, your questions. We'll try our best to, to, um, to answer them uh, during this, uh, this chat. Um, to we, we have uh, let's say 20 minutes uh, of discussion together so i will ask the panelists to be as brief as possible in in their answers because there's a lot uh, to, to cover and i would um i would actually like to start link to what Pat, uh, patrick just said um in your opinion uh, and maybe we can start with uh, Costas and, and Junia and, 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 and then whoever wants to answer um, after that. In your opinion, why is have we waited to today to talk about fixed wireless access? 
Um, is it the technology that wasn't there? Is it the demand or supply that wasn't there? Uh, a, a willingness at regulation level? Um, Kosas, maybe a quick um, overview of what you think about that. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Indeed, today, if we look market uh, market data, we see fixed wireless access uh, gaining momentum. Uh, I mean, there are some uh, really interesting figures say, uh, indicating that more than 50% of service providers in all regions in the world offer fixed wireless access now. And in Western Europe, almost all service providers have fixed wireless access offering. And according to GSA report of December 2021, uh, there were 81 operators worldwide offering residential and small business 5G fixed wireless access broadband services, which represents an increase of 84% compared to December 2020. And uh, also projections for the future uh, prove that there will be more than 80 million fixed wireless access connections by the end uh, by the end of 2022 and this number is forecast to grow almost threefold towards 2027 and uh, with 5g fixed wireless access gaining more and more uh, share of this uh, this increased momentum for fixed wireless access i believe is first of all due to network performance improvements that make fixed wireless access suitable for several use cases including extensive video streaming for example and furthermore new spectrum in several bands becomes available globally and the network cost per delivered bit keeps dropping enabling a viable operator business case for fixed wireless access and uh, making it affordable to households for services such as TV and video streaming. Uh, also, fixed wireless access offers additional revenue streams. And uh, also, fixed wireless access is now supported and included in um, government's initiatives. Uh, governments launched various programs and subsidies to support and speed up broadband network rollouts. And fixed wireless access is included in, in such kind of tools. So I think for all these, for all these reasons, we see this uh, increased momentum of fixed, of fixed wireless access today. Thank you, Kostas. Uh, Julien, maybe a, f a few uh, additional points on that? On yes. Side? Yeah, I mean, uh, very few because I think Kostas <laughs> said most of it. So uh, I will try to focus a bit more. Um, I think it has been mentioned also by Patrick. Uh, fixed wireless access overall has been there for even more, I mean, 20 years and so on. There are big differences though. Uh, today, there is a strong 3GPP ecosystem. There is no question which technology to be used. It's clear. Uh, things are scaling up. 4G uh, fixed wireless access was also um, deployed widely. I mean, uh, there is an existing path. You can also leverage the existing mobile infrastructure that is in place to add on this. So, I mean, it's all accelerating stuff. Um, is, I'm glad to see that Costas is using GSA statistics because uh, we, this is the, the, the purpose of our activities, try to educate, give market, market uh, industry information. Uh, in terms of the CPEs, uh, we also see a, a very quick uptake in the numbers of commercial uh, products available. We are now 213. Uh, 5G fixed wireless access commercial products announced is 61% more than last year. So the, this is also uh, creating a demand. And finally, just to focus maybe on the European side of things, I think uh, the fact that uh, the C band is widely uh, made available now is also playing a critical role uh, because this is, I think, the, the ideal uh, kind of band for fixed wireless access because it's a good mix between coverage capability and capacity. And I, I will stop here. Thank you, Julien. Just just uh, to, to wrap up this, this question, because we have a, a, a lot more. And um, um, Patrick, you were mentioning millimeter waves. Uh, we know that in, in um, Europe, it's not deployed as fast as, as we want. Maybe COVID was uh, partly responsible for, uh, for the delays. Um, 
what difference would it bring to the fixed wireless access compared to what we have now? Uh, in, it, in it, would be, it would be a game changer. Um, a lot of operators still don't understand how to use millimeter wave. They, they tried in North America to deploy it for handsets and it, 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 it failed miserably because it's the wrong sort of technology for, for mobile connectivity. Um, what they've realized now is that it's actually perfect for fixed wireless access. Um, the spectrum that's needed for millimeter wave is, is, is outside of the spectrum required for, for 5G. So the problem that we're seeing at the moment with um, 5G spectrum is people are paying a lot of money for between 50 and 100 megahertz. Um, data is increasing on networks at the rate of 30% year on year. If they were to deploy fixed wireless access of 5G only, um, it, it's it's fairly easy to do the math that you're going to be running into challenges, you know, five or six years down the line, um, especially with the increase in in capacity uh, with with CPE equipment um, over over the next two to three years. Uh, 3GPP happens next year. That means it's going to have an impact uh, a year after that. Uh, millimeter wave. To give you an example, um, if you were to use fixed wireless access on 5G spectrum. Think of it as um, a two-lane highway giving you between, well, I think our fastest device at the moment is about three, three and a half gigabits per second. Um, but if you deploy millimeter wave on, on spectrum, which in many countries is free spectrum. So one, one of the countries we're working with at the moment, they've got 50 megahertz of 5G, but they've got 400 megahertz of millimeter wave for free. So uh, a millimeter wave connection is like a 10 lane super highway. Um, each, each channel is, is much, much faster than on 5G. So in, in trials that we're seeing at the moment in one country, um, we're achieving uh, 20 gigabits per second over uh, 5,000 5, meters. Problem with millimeter wave though is it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a point to point technology. It's direct line of sight technology. Um, so that poses its own challenges. But what we're seeing now is, is innovation coming down the line, such as RIS, um, that can have little cheap, uh, it, it's a reflection technology, but it can be deployed on handsets, it can be deployed on street furniture. Um, it, it, we're looking at an initiative, uh, Verizon in the US are actually putting these nodes on uh, street lampposts. Um, tiny little cost, um, they're working with the energy companies, uh, doing it as a service. And it's, it's providing ideas for other innovators uh, around the world um, to, to implement the, these sorts of initiatives. And, and what we're seeing this year is we're seeing a lot of countries, especially in, in Eastern Europe and, and over in the U North America and Latin America, experimenting with this now purely on fixed wireless access. If they can take fixed wireless access out of the 5G spectrum and put it into the, the high end spectrum, you know, north of 26 gigahertz, all of a sudden fixed wireless access comes really into its own and doesn't have the massive impact that will have on quality spectrum. Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, turning into the implementation of, of uh, fixed wireless access, um, then I have actually um, a question from the audience that um, we won't have time to go through the 27 member state of, of, um, of the EU, but um, can you get, give us, in, in, your, uh, in your case, a concrete example of uh, fixed wireless uh, access supportive policy you, you've implemented? You, you touch on, on several um, uh, funding, for example, uh, aspects uh, during your presentation. Is there more that we have to know? Uh, <clears throat> no, I'm um, not sure there is a lot more. Uh, and the, 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 the most funding, important yeah I, I think the, the the funding is the most important that that we can do for the for the moment and then of course uh, uh, availability of, of frequency resources uh, which we are uh, yeah, we have a project uh, going on uh, now where we are looking at uh, new frequency bands uh, not concluded yet but um, um i guess uh, I, I guess the funding would be the 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 main thing that we can uh, that we can uh, contribute with thank you um uh, yes sure maybe i can add an example uh, just because 
you, you and I are French, so let, let's speak about France just quickly. Um, th there is, for example, you know, this Cohesion des Territoires program. Uh, in fact, it was a 100 million euro uh, budget to subsidize CPEs. And before it was 150 euros per unit. And uh, the government uh, last year, I think, announced that they will double this to 300 euros. And in some specific uh, circumstances, it can go up to 600 euros to finance. I think in the Nordics also, you can deduct from your taxes the professional installation. I mean, th there are different schemes like this. And you have, of course, the you know, uh, coverage obligation and uh, also the NBPs and so on. I, I stop here. <laughs> Thank you. It, it's actually a very good transition to to Katri to one um, uh, confirm or not uh, the the um, subsidy side uh, for um, uh, getting uh, access to fix or less, and um, a question from from the audience to you, Katri. Uh, they want to know what is the total number of fix or less access subscription uh, in in Finland. Uh, obviously, I guess from from DNA. And how many installations per day are um, are you roughly doing or seeing on the market? Yeah, so like I said, the definition of fixed wireless access uh, kind of varies also within the market. Um, we see fixed wireless access uh, as of this special product with the speed guarantee. We are the only one offering this type of solution in the market. But if, if we think like, um, all and, and we started to talk about fixed wireless access in Finland when 5G and outdoor units came. So that's the kind of the, really the definition. Um, and if we think of the market today, my estimation, I can't share our figures, but uh, we have three big players in, in Finland. So it's highly competitive market. And then we have these kind of um, uh, smaller fiber players that are getting uh investments uh, that want to kind of inf uh, build infrastructure in in finland so the, the competition in this kind of sde market at the moment is is heated up uh and it's good for the customers because they they have then uh, more opportunities and and that's what i like about fixed wireless access that we can give them more opportunities to choose from uh, but regarding the volume, so if we consider 5g subscriptions with outdoor units uh I would say that we are starting to be close to 100,000 uh, installations in the Finnish market, ap approximately. We don't have exact data on, on this one, and none of the, the operators here are uh, publishing exact figures. Thank you uh, for, for giving us figures uh, in, in the first place. Um, a last um, a brief question on, on the, this regulatory um, aspects um, that directed to you, uh, Costas, um, from the audience. Um, again, if you uh, can, can be brief with the answer, um, I guess we still have like seven minutes to go. Um, so uh, T-Mobile in the US is bringing 5G to 99%, mostly on 100 megabit per second, uh, without subsidies. Should uh, we do similar in Greece and in Europe, or should it be subsidized? I guess it's the ratio, or, or and it's also a, a good link to the my last question uh, for you. It, it's uh, and and the next session is. Until what point can it be private investment and when should it be subsidized, if any, on fixed wireless access? What's your opinion on that? Well, thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, as, as you already pointed out uh, in, in one of your earlier statements, in my opinion, I, I, I would agree with you, especially Greece is a kind of uh, a type of country that is, in my opinion, well suited for fixed wireless access. This is because of uh, morphology and topology challenges. So we have we have a lot of islands. First of all, we have a lot of mountains. We have a lot of rural areas. Uh, I think 45% of our population is 
uh, uh, is around two big cities and all the rest uh, areas of Greece are sparsely populated. And we also face seasonality challenges. I'm talking about summertime with a lot of tourists um, visiting Greece. Um, so I, I could give an example of Santorini Island, uh, but during winter time, the population of the island is, I don't know, 5,000 people. Uh, during summer, maybe it's millions. <laughs> so, uh, um, so indeed, I think Greece is is a country uh, where fixed wireless access would could make sense. Not the only country in Europe, also others. But uh, what we see today is that fixed wireless access deployment in Greece is very limited. So it seems that our operators maybe uh, prefer other other technologies. Uh, Greece has been traditionally based on copper network. Now they, there are a lot of investment plans towards fiber, but I think fixed wireless access should be considered. And at this point that we want to uh, introduce this technology and motivate the use of these technologies, subsidies are really required. So. Uh, at least fixed wireless access should be included and treated equally to other technologies in existing framework programs. But also maybe we can consider designing some special instruments focused on fixed wireless deployment for, for, for Greece. Um, from a regulatory point of view, a couple of, a couple of comments I, I also mentioned in my original statement. It's, uh, first of all, we need to, uh, to see the spectrum part because of course, it is required for five uh, fixed wireless access deployment and also access to, to poles and street lights and all this public infrastructure would indeed benefit the deployment and uh, rollout of fixed wireless access. Thank you very much, Costas. And uh, I had a last question that will do the junction with the new uh, the, the next session. I need you to answer in 25 seconds. That's the challenge. <laughs> and that's on, um, and, and obviously who, who wants to answer go, goes first, on the return on investment uh, for fixed uh, wireless access. Maybe Katri, you can, you can uh, have a very, very few words on that as, as you are hands-on on that. And, and uh, whoever wants to go after, um, if we can have everybody, that would be great. Well, sorry, can you can you say the question again? So, oh, the return on investment of the, ah, the return of investment as compared to other technologies. Uh, well, of course, uh, depending where you feel the fiber, it it can vary from years to to over ten years. Uh, and and with fixed fixed wireless access, uh, we try to get it uh, in in a much much shorter period of time. So, if, from operator perspective, yes, definitely the the ROI is 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 better. Okay, Bent maybe. Sorry. Um, well, as as a regulator, I'm not sure that uh, <laughs> I have a um, lot of comments on that. No, but as financing uh, one or the other technology um, and and uh, prominence of fixed wireless access right now. Uh, I guess to us, uh, the, the important thing is uh, uh, to, to uh, that, that everybody should uh, should have high capacity uh, broadband and what uh, technology they will have that. Uh, uh, I, I, we will not choose. <laughs> Thank you, Julien. Yes, I think um, what very shortly uh, in this question, you have to study, you know, what kind of uh, area you're covering and so on and so forth. So maybe I will just refer to a recent study, not from GSA, but from the GSMA intelligence. Recently, they published uh, a cost analysis, a cost modeling report looking at uh, these topics. And you can see that the cost is uh, between 80 percent less using fixed wireless access than fiber in rural areas up to 44 or 45 i don't remember percent uh, in urban areas but you need to to look precisely at the assumptions and so on but generally speaking yes the, the return on investment is much shorter thank you costas i saw your hand 
Yeah, very, very briefly, three comments. Fixed wireless access has for sure shorter time to market than fiber. Second, fixed wireless access has a more attractive and investment investment and risk profile than fiber. Yes. Uh, and third, fixed wireless access deployments reuse existing infrastructure. These three points, uh, in my opinion, are make the business the business model and the expected return of investment of fixed wireless access uh, quite interesting. Thank you, Kostas. And uh, last few seconds, Patrick. In the discussions we have, it's always down to the TCO model of the, 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 the customer, um, in which case you, you've got two types of fiber, um, not one, um, fiber to the home, fiber through the air. Fiber through the air is very cheap. Um, it's only designed to last about three years. The weather takes it out, it's, it's, but it's cheap. Um, used for certain types of customer. Fiber to the home is very expensive, um, but um, it's, like, it's designed to last 30 years. Uh, and it can be upgraded and so on. And then there's a third category where fixed wireless access is perfect. Uh, fixed wireless access competes directly with fiber now, and in some cases exceeds the, the speed of fiber. So now it's all down to the TCO. Thank you. Uh, wrapped up in 20 seconds each. Thank you very much for uh, being on this panel. I hope the audience uh, uh, could uh, gain some insights about fixed wireless as, uh, access infrastructure side. And I uh, will leave you with a short break because, uh, before we continue with the second session on um, uh, investments. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Stephanie, thanks. thank you so much. And uh, I'd like to also add my thanks to Stephanie to all of our panelists uh, for, uh, for a really, really interesting discussion. And of course, to Franco as well for his keynote to kick things off at the, at the start of the day. So thank you all so much. I uh, really appreciate that. And I'm uh, sorry that we couldn't carry on. I'm sure we could have carried on that. <laughs> a lot longer that's for sure thank you so much thank you um so uh yeah so that's the end of the first panel uh we're now going to have a short break uh so uh we're going to be having around about a 15 minute break uh, and then we're going to be back at around about quarter past 11 uh central european time uh for the second of our panels today uh the issue of funding has of course just been uh brought up towards the end of that session there has been something that's been discussed in a little bit of detail there we're next going to be going into a lot more detail in that and focusing on public funding initiatives to support fixed wireless access and how we can maximize the available support so that's going to be back here on the main stage in just around about 15 minutes or so in the meantime, uh, thank you again to our panelists for this morning's session. Uh, thank you to all of you out there for all your comments and questions as well. Uh, feel free to go out and uh, make yourself a quick tea or coffee and uh, make sure you're back here in 15 minutes for session two. See you shortly. Thank you. <laughs>